everyone, welcome to our Ithaca College Sustainability Lecture Series. I'm Xiao Yu Dong, a graduate student in, in the Ithaca College Communication Program. Our guest today is Dr. Corey Yang, and she's a professor and chair of the graduate program in the Department of Strategic Communication. And her academic research area spans from crisis communication, government and shareholder relations, to organizational culture and social responsibility. Hi, Corey. Hi. Um, so um, today's topic will be how an organization can be more sustainable in its employees' relation. Um, so let's start with why should organizations have a sustainability focus in their employee um, relations? Well, before I get into that, I would actually like to explain what I mean by <coughs> organizations being sustainable towards their employees. So I have three particular ideas in terms of this. One is sustainability, obviously. The second is balance, and the third is growth. So <clears throat> when I'm talking about sustainability, I'm talking about keeping up. That's kind of the idea behind what it means to sustain something, right? Mm -hmm. But also balance and growth. So if we talk about a good relationship in which organizations are being sustainable towards its employees, then that would allow both the organization and the employees to be able to keep up with the demands in a way that doesn't throw either party off balance. And it also means that the relationship between the employee and the organization allows for both to grow. Um, and so this would be <clears throat> a good relationship. When we're talking about balance, then, we are specifically talking about finding and identifying that tipping point, and that term is directly from Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote a book called Tipping Point. Um, and the tipping point is where is there too much in terms of a bunch of different kinds of things. So when people say that a relationship um, between an employee and an organization is not sustainable, they mean that it is the tipping point is too much in terms of whatever. So it could be um, change, like too much change, too many responsibilities, being pulled in different directions with too many priorities. It could be too much stress, either physical, mental, or emotional. Um, and so therefore, because of all these things, it throws the balance off between employees and their personal life, but also the organization and its employees as well. The last part of this idea of sustainability has to do with growth. And this can either be advancement in a particular position for employees or the personal health and well-being of both the organization and its employees. So uh, one of the things that uh, I think about this is if a company is being sustainable towards its employees, it's helping the employee grow in a personal way. So that could be providing training or anything like this to help the employee develop more KSAs. And KSAs are knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, the easiest way to think about this is in a systems perspective. You know, an organization is like an organism. It gets inputs from the environment and transforms it somehow. So if there isn't any of that pulling in of resources and things to transform them, then an organization dies. Well, it's the same thing with an employee. No growth equals death, not physically, but in terms of unhappy employees, unsatisfied employees, or unmotivated employees. And all of those then contribute to an organization not growing as well. So to go back to your original question about why organizations should be sustainable towards their employees, it's because without any of these things, sustaining or keeping up, but not to the point of throwing people off balance, mm -hmm. and balance to the point where both parties can grow, and not to the other point. That is one of the main reasons why organizations have to be sustainable to their employees, to allow the organization to grow by allowing the person to grow, by allowing the employee to grow. Cool. Um, so how would you describe a sustainable relationship between an organization and its employees? What are the key elements? Well, I think sustain being able to sustain or keep up, like I mentioned, balance and growth. So I believe in terms of that, it would be good to provide an example. So right. 
An example would be Wegmans, and another example would be Cornell. And I'll use both of these companies because from an outside perspective, people specifically come to these organizations because of the benefits that the company provides to be able to help the employee to be sustainable and in doing so make themselves sustainable. So I have here some information about Cornell because they have a really good reputation for providing many benefits that other colleges don't. And so some of the um, particular ideas about this came directly from the website. Whether you come to Cornell for a semester or a lifetime, resources abound for your growing career. Taking care of yourself, your family, and your pets, and making connections at Cornell in the community. So they're even thinking like it's not just about you as the employee, but it's about your family, it's about the community, it's about your pets. Um, and they acknowledge life extends beyond your job. So these resources are available to help with life's other aspects, whether involving parenting, caregiving, for others taking care of a pet or just yourself. Now, you look on any other company's website and it's not going to be quite the same. So Cornell has something very unique here that helps to make it sustainable. So some of the things that would be considered benefits are flex time and work arrangements so that individuals can make up their own hours so long as they get 40 hours a week. You can come in at 6 o'clock in the morning if you feel like it and leave at 2 o'clock or you can come in at 10 o'clock at night and work until 7 o'clock. So you pick your own hours in terms of your um, work arrangements. They also have an on-campus diaper changing station. They have lactation rooms for women that are um, you know, had just given birth and they need to feed their child rather than pumping the breast milk and then, you know, sending it, they actually have rooms where women can go for privacy reasons to feed their child. Aww. They also provide on-site daycare so you can actually have your child there and when the child is hungry you simply can take the child to the lactation room and, and you know, feed your child. They also offer adoption assistance and um, elder or adult care so that would be if you have family members who are elderly there's actually programs that you can um, have resources for to be able to take care of elderly parents. Uh, there's also financial assistance to faculty and or staff in terms of emergency related issues. So when I believe it was Hurricane Irene that came through, there were many people that lost their houses or had significant damage due to flooding. So you would be able to apply to this assistance uh, fund and get money to be able to help with the cleanup or the care, whatever related to that. Um, there's also contact and profile of potential helpers for babysitting, pet sitting, errands, house sitting, yard care, music lessons, tutoring, cleaning, sport lessons, and fitness training. And then there's pet insurance. So if you have pets, you can actually get insurance through the Human Resources Office. Um, local pet services and discounts that can help manage your pet's care. Um, and last but not least, workshops and services specifically for faculty and staff to enhance their mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Wow. So when I look at something like Cornell and I look at another institution, the, clearly from this perspective, they recognize that you're not just an employee, that you have a life outside of work, and that they want to do everything they can to be able to promote a balance between work and family life. The only thing that I wanted to say about this was that at some point in time organizations still have to hold employees accountable because it can't just be that employees have all these benefits and don't work, right? Yeah. So in order to help the organization be sustainable, there have to be mechanisms in place where people don't take advantage of that to the point where the organization suffers and the work isn't done. Mm -hmm. Another company that I've done quite a lot of research on in terms of corporate social responsibility is Wegmans because according to a Fortune 100 magazine, they were the top third employer in the United States right. for, for these reasons. So um, off of their website, I picked up, in order to attract and retain the best people, we offer competitive benefits that make the perfect complement to the employment experience for both full-time and part-time employees. So even if you only work 10 hours a week, you get all the same benefits as if you were a full-time employee. So one is um, career development and growth opportunities, flexible uh, scheduling, fast-paced environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, employee discounts, reduced membership to fitness centers, joining a Wegmans sports team, 
skiing, movies, cultural events, special activities, auto services, sports discounts, and other things to like Walt Disney World, Cypress Gardens, these kinds of things. So Wegmans is different because they offer this to both full-time and part-time employees, which is really something that's quite unique in companies nowadays. So those are examples um, that, you know, take into consideration the three things I mentioned before about sustain, growth, and then balance. Cool. Um, so um, for organizations considering become more sustainable, how do you achieve success with regard to your employee base? So one thing that I was thinking of, and one thing that I know organizations do, mm -hmm. is do an internal communication survey. So without doing this, um, an organization isn't able to know what is important to an employee. Mm -hmm. uh, so the survey itself would be taking an inventory of what kind of resources are available in the organization and matching that with what employees say are important. And if these two things don't match, then there's the potential for the organization not to be sustainable. But if these two things do, then there's the potential for both the employee to be happy and satisfied, et cetera, and the organization because they're getting the maximum amount of effort out of an, out of an employee. So I think it starts internally, but also there's a concept that I'm not quite sure many people are familiar with, and that's called boundary spanning. So it simply isn't taking a survey or the internal pulse of what's inside the company, but also doing the same externally. So for example, there may be some kind of issue that people outside the company are concerned with. One might be social media, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's not only, okay, are employees wanting to use social media? There might be issues that you have to take into consideration, but if you're not looking on the outside of the company, then you might not necessarily know that that could be something that's important. Right. So it's basically doing an internal and external survey or a SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to determine what is most appropriate to have an employee be as satisfied as possible while also satisfying the organization in terms of its needs. Hmm. And that's the way that you maintain sustainability. Um, so we all know about Walmart's global reputation for mistreating their employees. Yes. And uh, for 2011, a group of women also filed a sex discrimination lawsuit against Walmart. Can you share some of your thoughts uh, how this negative public um, reputation might affect Walmart and what steps an organization can take to, re to reverse the situation? So in all reality, um, you. This is something that Walmart has been dealing with actually since about 2007. Yes. And this is a pattern of behavior. And what was happening was that a certain number of women, and, and the number I'm not quite sure of, but it was enough to make a class action lawsuit. So it happened at almost every single store, and it was a, a mass amount of people. Walmart was, number one, not promoting women. So if you looked at the, the tier of who's up in the higher administration and, and you know, who's kind of you know, the sort of staff, women were more than likely represented on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just women, it was also minorities. So there were very few people of color or of, um, you know, female origin, if you will, that actually were able to make it through the ranks. That was one part. The second part was that individuals were being asked to punch out, you know, their time card, right. and then working 10 to 12 hours overtime without getting paid. So it wasn't just that they weren't getting promoted. There's okay. actually something called wage theft, uh -huh. which means that the women weren't getting paid what they should have been getting paid, but they were asked by administrators to punch out, and then it was basically free labor. So enough of this happened to enough of the women within the company to file what they called a sexual discrimination lawsuit. Um, and uh, I always thought that was kind of interesting because rather than saying it was a gender discrimination lawsuit, it was a sexual discrimination lawsuit, which is a, a difference in semantics and terms. So one of the things I know that Walmart started to do was advertise on television and YouTube and some other places. They picked very specific people and showed how they had moved through the ranks. Mm -hmm. 
and made it so that it was sort of dispelling the stereotype. Oh, it's not all women. There are certain females that have been able to advance and get through. And um, that paralleled with advertisements on television and elsewhere that showed minorities as well, that were able somehow to dispel this sort of stereotype. So <clears throat> one of the ways that Walmart can reverse this is doing exactly what I had suggested before, doing an internal survey, doing an external survey, finding out what's going on with employees and determining whether or not an employee's um, desire or complaint or something is valid and then matching up resources with what the employees want. Mm -hmm. Because see, to not do so, it's not very sustainable mm -hmm. in the sense that if you have enough women that this is happening to, eventually they're going to quit, which is time, you know, more cost towards a company because you have to go through the process of hiring somebody else. Now granted, there's a lot of people that probably need a job for Walmart, but it's not the same because you don't get the consistency of the same employees. You know, if there's lots and lots of turnover, you know, that reduces inefficiencies and, you know, reduces the effectiveness of the company itself. So simply by taking an internal pulse of your organization and figuring out what's wrong, matching that up with the resources, it can save the company a lot of money. So do you think there is a value um, to an organization to create a publish um, um, a cooperation social responsibility report? Yes, and in fact, there are many companies that do so. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is partly due to internal and external stakeholders. It's also partly due to the fact that corporations are under a bigger microscope now because of things like Enron, the Arthur Anderson, um, some of the other major companies that kind of were embroiled in a scandal, right? Mm -hmm. So there are more people that are asking for companies to be accountable. And in terms of being accountable, one way is to create a report that's available to all stakeholders that discusses what the corporate social responsibility is for a particular company. Um, how, do you, how do companies avoid the perception of greenwashing of the organization through their corporate social responsibility report? There's a couple of different things associated with this. So greenwashing can be you're simply saying that you're socially responsible when you're really not. Mm -hmm. Or you sell products like filtered water, but you do so in a container that has um, BPAs and is very, you know, the plastic isn't good for you, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of the perception of greenwashing, Perception is about how people see the product and whether or not the product is truly sustainable or not. Um, and then whether or not the company is simply just putting it there because stakeholders have asked for it. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that people can avoid that perception is number one, if you're really not socially responsible in terms of everything about social responsibility being integrated into your corporate structure, mm -hmm then simply don't create a report. Because the minute that you do, you're putting information out there that says this is what your company is like. Uh -huh. um, so that's one way to avoid that. The other way would be to, if you do have some sort of corporate social responsibility structure, then make it align with the information that you're publishing. So instead of saying, well, we're doing all of these particular kinds of things, maybe focusing on one thing that you know you're doing well. Um, are there any standards for what we should be included in such reports of organizations' progress in all areas of sustainability, like economic, um, environmental, and social? Yes, and in fact, there is a, an organization called ISO, mm -hmm. and it's called the International Standard Organization. They actually created a standard, and it's ISO 26000. And it does lay out very specifically what an organization do, can do to be socially responsible. So in terms of this, if you publish a report, it would be very good to align the report with the standards that the company had set out. Okay. Um, how, okay, how did you infuse sustainability concept into your coursework? So when I arrived here, I was 
tasked with the ability to create a new class called Government and Stakeholder Relations. And when I thought about this, the first thing that came to my mind was how organizations develop their corporate social responsibility. So I went through the process of creating a class and I built in, this is the thing that I'm going to talk about. But more importantly, in terms of this, the, the first thing that I do in the class is that I talk about what is a corporation. Because a, a corporation is very different from an organization. There is actually a legal definition of a corporation. And so I start with that. And then I talk about government. So what are the kind of uh, rules and regulations that a corporation has to abide by? And these are the things that I talk about, like um, Sarbane-Oxley, which is a direct result of Enron in terms of financial reporting and being transparent. So we talk about that. Um, we also talk about transparency overall in terms of how transparent you want to be. Do you want to reveal everything? Do you want to reveal something? Do you want to reveal a little tiny bit? Uh, and so we talk about those things. And then the relationship part is where we talk about sustainability and responsibility. So when I taught the class two semesters ago, two spring, so this was spring 2011, one of the projects that the students worked on was developing a chapter for our introductory communication textbook. And we specifically chose a framework that was developed by um, Chandler and Werther, and it's called Strategic Corporate Social Responsibility. And they lay out all these different components and elements. So we decided to take this information and apply the framework to analyzing two companies that we thought would be the most sustainable. And the two companies we picked were Google and Wegmans. So the end result was that a chapter was developed for this introductory text so that everybody that comes into the Park School and takes the introduction to strategic communication knows then how to be able to look at corporate social responsibility from a strategic perspective and also to understand the relationships that corporations have with the government and with their stakeholders. That's great. Um, so what advice do you have for other faculties to integrate sustainability topics into their coursework? Number one, I think you have to determine if sustainability or corporate social responsibility is appropriate. Mm -hmm. If you're teaching French, that may or may not necessarily be appropriate for you to integrate that particular kind of idea into your course. But if you are teaching like uh, an introduction to corporate communication, that should be an aspect that you talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you are talking about designing communication strategies. One strategy is how organizations develop their corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it really truly depends on the type of class and the sort of structural units that would be appropriate for that class. Okay. So the last but not, not the least, to conclude today's interview, um, can you please give us a, your perspective on what sustainability means in communication terms? And how would you suggest individuals to practice sustainability on a daily basis. Okay, so sustainability in communication terms is something that is entirely socially constructed. So how you define social responsibility or sustainability isn't quite the same as how I would define it. And even in terms of this, this interview, the two terms, sustainability, corporate social responsibility, have been blended to, to sort of equate. Um, so how I would define that is by looking how people actually phrase it and talk about it. How are people framing the issue? Sustainability can mean everything from environment to um, organizational. It can mean a whole bunch of different kind of things. Corporate social responsibility is a little bit different because the focus is different. Mm -hmm. So that would be how I would answer sustainability in communication terms. It's all socially constructed, it's how people frame the issue, and then more so how it's about getting people to buy into that. So people may feel like social responsibility is great personally, but you have to be able to convince an organization that it's worthwhile to be able to do something related to that. In terms of how individuals can practice sustainability on a daily basis, that is up to the individual to determine what it means to be sustainable. Mm. Some people will say that, well, to be sustainable, that means when I drink coffee in the morning, I bring my own mug so that I'm not producing more waste that isn't biodegradable. 
that could be one aspect. So looking at what you do overall, choices, etc. I do know one other part here at Ithaca College is that we have something called the Green Office Campaign. And it basically um, gives people an opportunity to say, well, how green is your office? Do you leave the air conditioning on? Do you leave your computer on? Do you leave your speakers on? All of those things are very simple choices that people can make to either, you know, be sustainable or not. If you're talking about the practice of sustainability in terms of being an employee and how to be a more sustainable individual within an organization, that also requires choices but in a different kind. So that might mean making a choice to say, I'm not really able to do this project because I have five other ones. Or if you um, are someone who wants to be an advocate, say for example, that there's something that isn't considered sustainable, that you actually speak up and talk about that kind of stuff to a particular human resources personnel or someone in the company. So these are ways I think that employees and individuals can practice sustainability on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sherry.